Are you ready? We're ready. We're ready. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. It's uh, chat with uh, Green Aggies, October 8th. Uh, my name is uh, Meng Mangu. I'm a professor extension specialist in the horticulture department. And I have five more uh, panelists uh, with us today. When I say your name, would you raise your hand? Uh, on my screen here, I have our uh, uh, IP, IPM specialist, Airfong from Overton, uh, Laura Miller, a hort agent from Tarrant County, uh, Paul Winsky, hort agent from Harris County, Dr. Becky Grubbs, uh, Water Institute at Dallas, and also Carlos Bogron, uh, our volunteer from uh, OHP. Uh, if you were, uh, if you were with us last week, you probably remember. Uh, you probably remember Dr. Becky Bolin was talking about uh, cool season weed management, and and during the presentation. By the way, it's it's totally cool. It's a really nice presentation, and if you could just remember the link of this playlist of our uh, chat with Green, <laughs> Green Aggies. Uh, that will be wonderful, but don't worry about it. I'll copy and paste the link in the, uh, in the chat box for you all later on. Um, so uh, during uh, her presentation, uh, she mentioned some of the natural products like a, a gluten meal, you know, a corn meal or, or mustard seed meal and stuff like that. And she asked me whether I could talk a little bit about uh, uh, mustard seed meal because uh, we have uh, done some research on that and I blanked out and said no. Uh, <laughs> the reason that I want to say no is because uh, one of my students uh, did her uh, thesis, did her whole uh, master project on this, which is what I'm going to present to you today because I think it deserves uh, a whole two hours, um, you know, to summarize her uh, two years of work. But don't worry, we're not going to go for two hours. So um, uh, my student Vicky, Vicky did her thesis on the herbicidal activities of mustard seed meal. Uh, and there, in her uh, thesis, there are two types. One is uh, um, Synapse uh, Alba, Ida Gold is the commercial name, and Brassica Jonesia, Pacific Gold, on weed and vegetable emergence. So let's dive in. So, you know, just a little bit about weed control. Of course, uh, I'm just kind of reiterating what uh, Dr. Uh, Grubb said last week. You know, there are chemicals, there are uh, physical methods, and uh, there are also bioherbicides, you know, like the dried distilled grains with solubles, uh, corn gluten meals. And of course, the star of this week today, um, mustard seed meal. So I'm gonna call it MSMs. So this is what the uh, mustard seed meal uh, looks like. This is a, a small operation. I actually, uh, there's about two years ago when I visited the, the California, the, uh, you know, where they were making the uh, mustard seed meal, it's a much, much bigger, I mean, much bigger process. But I was a little lazy going back to find that uh, picture of, you know, of the manufacturer. So uh, mustard seed meals are byproducts, you know, resulting from crushing mustard seeds to uh, provide oil for the production of biodiesel. So, you know, what you got is, is somewhat a little uh, flaky, you know, looking, uh, you know, seed meal, the, the, the solid mass of the mustard seeds. And oftentimes uh, people may, you know, uh, pelletize um, the mustard seed meal and make it uh, uh, just, just, you know, uh, easier to handle. So let's get into the, uh, let's get into the, uh, the chemistry of the, uh, of the mustard seed meal. And the main thing about mustard seed meal is that they contain um, uh, glutathionates, glutathionates. Um, so it's it just uh, uh, you know uh, a group of chemicals, and then when we add uh, mustard seed meal to to soil to moist soil, so uh, there's a hydrolysis going on. It's a myrosinase catalysis. So the the glutathionase, uh, glu uh, glucosinolates, uh, 
glucosinolates um, is going to change to uh, isothiocinolates, uh, ITS. And then that's going to change to the ionic uh, theocyanates. And you're going to say, well, I can understand ITS, you know, it's from ITC, I mean, ITC, it's the uh, kind of like the short name for ITC. But what is SCN? Where's the SCN in the uh, theocyanates? And actually, that's the uh, chemical structure of theocyanates. It's, you know, it's actually S and then the two bonds and C with their two bonds between C and N. So, uh, so SCN is theocyanates. It's not the acronym, uh, you know, not like ITS is the acronym of isothiocyanates. Uh, SCN is literally the, the chemical structure of theocyanates. So if it's OCN, sorry, I'm just, I love chemistry. I'm just going to dig slightly deeper into this. So if, if it's OCN, it's cyanates. It's, if it's OCN, it's cyanates. So, uh, so theocyanates uh, is uh, S, sulfur replaced the oxygen in this, you know, in this uh, structure. So when it comes to the mechanism of wheat suppression, uh, there are two folds. There are two folds of uh, wheat suppression here. So SCN, theocyanates, uh, it inhibits chlorophyll synthesis. And then the ITS, uh, isothiocyanates, it binds to protein of metabolism. So they kind of, you know, uh, affect the, uh, you know, wheat suppression in those two ways. So when it comes to these two specific uh, mustard, you know, this, these two specific mustard seed meal, uh, in Pacific Gold, in Brassica Jonesia, um, it, they have a lot two propanol glucosinolates, two propanol uh, glucosinates, and that change to two propanol ITC. And this is volatile. It's important here. <laughs> uh, so this is volatile. And in Synap in Synapis alba, they have four majority of the content of the, of the uh, glucosinolates is four hydroxyl benzyl glucosinolate, and that's going to change to uh, four hydroxyl benzyl ITC, which is not stable, and then that changed to a uh, type of uh, uh, theocyanates, and that's soluble. So. Uh, just you know, the 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 short message here is that this one of these one of this uh, mustard seed meal seed, uh, seeds it, it contains a lot of volatile. When after hydrolysis, it contains a lot of volatile uh, substance. Uh, so that's a brassica juncia has volatile substances, and then for Synapis alba it has more soluble substances. So there's a slight change. There's a, just a slight change here, but it's, it's, it's important uh, later on, you know, uh, for the, uh, for the uh, experiment that, that we're doing. So we started with some uh, uh, Petri dish. We started with some Petri dish uh, experiment. And for all throughout, our uh, experiment, we used two types of um, wheat seeds. One is, uh, one is large crabgrass. One is large crabgrass. And the other one is, I'll show you later on. So, it's, so in, in these uh, petri dish experiments, um, so on one side is, is Ida Gold. That's the, um, the idigo, that's the one with more soluble substance. And this on the other side is uh, brassica with more um, uh, volatile substance. And then in the Petri dish, we mixed, we mixed uh, different amount of, of these, you know, these two type of uh, mustard seed meal with the soil. So this is a control. There is no mustard seed meal in it. And there, 50 grams per uh, 
uh, square meter. So this is this is in the way that uh, we you know uh, of course this is not a, a square meter. It's it's just uh, the amount that you know if we apply this to a square meter. So this is fifty, a uh, hundred, two hundred, and three hundred. And then within each of these uh, same amount of, uh, you know, within this same amount of uh, mustard seed meal, we also did half, half of the top half uh, was unsealed. So there's, you know, there's no sealing. So there's gas going in and out. And then the bottom half shows that these Petri dishes were sealed. So basically if there is a, you know, gas uh, product coming out of the mustard seed meal, mustard seed meal hydrolysis, you know, it will be sealed in, you know, see there's any actions. So as you can see a trend here, you know, if we look at the Ida gold here, you know, the trend is, um, and as you can see that these are the, uh, you know, uh, large crabgrass, you know, they're without mustard seed meal, they're germinating like crazy. If I remember correctly, we uh, put about 50 seeds. We put about 50 seeds per um, petri dish. And as you can see from the top uh, to the bottom, you can see a, a, a general trend of decreasing uh, germination. You know, a decreasing germination uh, of, of the large crabgrass. Um, and then uh, if you look at uh, within you know this within a certain amount, let's say fifty gram per fifty gram per uh, square meter, and you can see that the bottom one, the sealed one, you know the sealed petri dish, you know the seed germination is is much less than the the top you know than the the upper half where the uh, petri dish were not uh, sealed, and look at the hundred gram. Uh, definitely the case. And then uh, 200 grams, there's almost like no seed germination in the sealed one, but there are, you know, some in the, uh, in the unsealed one. And if you go to the, this side, remember Pacific gold, the brassica, the brassica species. Um, I'm going to go back to this one. If you remember this brassica Pacific gold, this species has mainly, mainly volatile has mainly volatile um, substance to propanol ITC versus in this uh, synapis, uh, you know, it has uh, soluble substance. So let's come back to this picture. As you can see that right here, you know, for this uh, Pacific gold, even at 50 grams under sealed condition, under sealed condition, you can see there's a, there's a huge difference. There's a huge difference. For, for Ida Gold, you know, at 50 gram, yes, there is a difference. You know, the, the, the unsealed and the sealed, there is a difference, but it was not as dramatic as uh, when the mustard seed meal is Pacific Gold. I mean, look at the difference. And when we look at the, there are still some, you know, one or two here and there, but then when the amount is increased to 100 grams, when the amount is increased to 100 grams, there's, there's, no, uh, there's no germination. Uh, you know, there is no germination in the Pacific Gold. And when you compare to this one, Ida Gold, there, there's still some. So you can totally see, you know, the uh, one is the difference, you know, in the amount, you know, from zero to 50, 120 and 30. And then on the other hand is the sealed and unsealed. So for, uh, you know, for Pacific Gold, even at 300 uh, grams, you know, there's still one or two here um, germinating, uh, you know, for the unsealed. But, but you know, at, at the sealed condition, you know, where the gas, where the volatile uh, substance is, um, you know, it's kept in, you know, kept in, uh, you know, the, the, you can see there is a, there is a very good control of the, uh, you know, of the large crabgrass. And you may see some of these, uh, these, uh, you know, stuff uh, growing in these things. So I want to remind you 
Uh, another thing, um, these mustard seed meal, uh, in addition to in addition to uh, these, uh, you know, substances that we were talking about, the glucosinolates that we we're talking about, they're also uh, full of proteins. So you know, that's uh, that's basically you know, it just um, protein, uh, just fertilizer in this case, and so that's why there's stuff uh, going on. It's kind of moldy. So uh, one was, you know, one set of the experiment was on uh, large crabgrass. And then we also tested uh, Palmar amaranth. That's another lovely uh, weed that we commonly see uh, on our, uh, you know, uh, yarn, uh, lawn and stuff. So it's, uh, it's a similar story. Um, what you can see, they're not, in this picture, they're not as green as the uh, large crabgrass, but you can see these little, you know, stuff here. So that shows you the, um, you know, the amount of uh, uh, germination that's showing. Very similar, very similar to the story that we have seen on large crabgrass. Um, you know, again here, you know, the the sealed, the bottom half, the sealed, is showing much better control. Uh, than the Anxio in terms of Pacific Gold. And when you compare uh, Pacific Gold with the, uh, the Ida Gold, that it seems like the Pacific Gold is controlling the, um, you know, the, the amaranth germination it better. You know, here even at 300, even at 300 grams, uh, you know, the amount, there's still some Ida Gold, uh, there's still some weeds showing up. <clears throat> so that was Petri dish. And then uh, we did a, um, then we did a, um, a greenhouse. We did a greenhouse container. We did a greenhouse container experiment. <clears throat> so it's, so we did uh, <clears throat> a laboratory petri dish study. We did a greenhouse container. And then later on we did an outdoor container. <clears throat> so in this, in this greenhouse uh, container study, so we basically, we, um, this line, there's no physical line here, but simply, you know, draw, uh, we draw the line for you to have a better view. Uh, lots of, lots of stuff going on here. So within each clusters, well, sorry, I switched place for you. So this time I put the uh, Pacific gold on the left side, Ida gold on the uh, right side. So, and then within each cluster, the left side, the left side of the container was sown with crabgrass. So this is the left side is crabgrass, the right side is amaranth, uh, pigweed. I think that's another name, pigweed. So crabgrass, amaranth, uh, amaranth, and then so this is zero, zero uh, grams of mustard seed meal, 1.5 grams, three grams, and 4.5 grams. So basically, you know, we gradually increase the amount of mustard seed meal in this case. Um, so this one, the mustard seed meal is incorporated, is incorporated with the, uh, with the potting mix. This one is incorporated with the potting mix. Here is surface uh, applied. So basically not, you know, mix, the mustard seed meal was not mixed with the potting mix, but simply, you know, uh, applied to the surface. So the story here is Ida Gold, similar, similar to the Pacific Gold story, um, you know, this is incorporated, mixed with potting mix. This one is surface uh, applied. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, let's just look at this one. You know, crabgrass zero, uh, uh, you know, uh, no mustard seed meal. You would, um, you would, you know, uh, expect that these seeds will germinate. And as you, uh, as we increase the amount, you know, um, Pacific Gold, even at 1.5, you know, you don't have a whole lot of germination. Either, you know, the mustard seed meal was um, mixed with potting mix or surface uh, applied. Um, for Ida Gold, for this one, that you can see that, um, uh, you know, at higher percentage uh, surface applied, you know, the, the effect was, was significant. Uh, but even, you know, at uh, 
when it's incorporated, when it's incorporated, you know, even at the highest rate, it's still, um, it's still, you know, you see some uh, germination uh, of crabgrass. It does have a good control of amaranth, you know, uh, even at 1.5 grams at the low, at the low, uh, low amount. Um, but for, but for uh, crabgrass, you know, even at the highest, uh, it's still showing. So I think the difference, the difference here, you know, the difference between uh, incorporated and the surface applied, uh, you know, when the mustard seed meal is incorporated, uh, the effect is kind of diluted to, you know, to the surface and the bottom of the, uh, of the potting mix. And versus when it's surface applied, you know, the, must, the, the effect of um, the mustard seed meal is concentrated on the surface uh, where the seeds, you know, where the seeds were uh, applied. So, uh, so, so this is definitely, uh, you know, one of the uh, take home message here for the, uh, for the um, mustard seed meal application, you know, when it's surface applied, it's probably uh, doing a better job than the uh, incorporated. In, in, case of, in the case of uh, Pacific Gold, it doesn't seem to matter. Uh, it doesn't seem to matter that much. Uh, probably, probably I'm gonna go back to the, the one uh, page uh, chemistry that we talked so much there. You know, in uh, Pacific Gold, uh, the, the main thing in this is, uh, is the volatile substance. You know, it's the volatile uh, compared to the soluble. Uh, substance. So, you know, if it's volatile, it's probably going to volatize up and, you know, kill in the, the wheat seeds <clears throat> on the way versus, versus uh, this one, you know, the substance is more soluble. So when it's soluble, you water it, it, it doesn't go up, it more likely uh, goes down and, you know, not affecting the wheat seeds. So that's in the greenhouse. And then uh, we took it outside and we took it outside and tested, we took it outside and tested in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, just, just took outside and see whether uh, mother nature may change the, you know, the change the, 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 the result a little bit. So here, what we have is, um, here, what we have is, um, is um, th we have three rates um, uh, back here. We have back here. We have had uh, uh, you know uh, four rates: zero, low, medium, and high. Uh, and then when we took it outdoor, because the high is so good, so we just not did not include it in it, and we just have zero. So this this these are five reps of the of the zero, and then these are the five reps of. Uh, of low, and this is the five reps of median, uh, medium rate, you know, 1.5 grams per uh, pod or th uh, three grams per pod. Um, so similarly, on the left side, you know, of the container is crabgrass, and then on the right side is amaranth. Uh, again, for, uh, you know, for no seed meal, you would imagine that they germinated uh, pretty well, you know, both, uh, uh, crabgrass and the amaranth, uh, they, they, they all germinated pretty well. And, and then when you, um, when you look at the, you know, the, um, the low and the medium, the low and medium, uh, sorry, I, there, there should be one, uh, a wide bar here separating the two, but you can roughly see the difference. So of course, the higher rate, of course, the higher rate is doing better than the lower rate. And of course, much better than the, uh, you know, no mustard seed meal. And then when you compare uh, the Ida gold with soluble stuff versus uh, uh, Pacific gold with volatile, uh, you know, this one is doing better uh, than the Ida gold. So this is Pacific Gold is with the uh, the volatile volatile uh, volatile uh, isothiocyanate, and Ida Gold is more with uh, 
with the uh, soluble uh, SCN. So, uh, you know, in terms of these two, it seems like uh, the ID goals exp expressed a uh, uh, better weed suppression efficacy on uh, polymer amethyst in the greenhouse versus the uh, Pacific gold was more effective on large crabgrass in greenhouse. Uh, you know, those microbial activity was due to the SEN in the, uh, in the, uh, in the, uh, in the content. And then outdoor, there may be some uh, precipitation. So, uh, so the next part of the, um, the next part of the uh, experiment has a lot to do with, you know, the why we were doing that has a lot to do with uh, this picture, uh, you know, in a lot of the production. Um, when in, in vegetable production, a lot of times, you know, you'll see we use these uh, plastic films for, for, um, for a weed control, for a weed control. And, um, and if we uh, use, this is, this is ideal if you think about the previous uh, experiment that we did. You know, we used a sealed and unsealed Petri dish to test out our, uh, um, to test out our uh, um, just, you know, in theory, whether it's going to work or not. And we can see that, uh, you know, the sealed uh, Petri dish, you know, is doing much better than the unsealed. And in containers, in containers, you know, in containers, there's no way that we could, uh, for container production, there's no way that we could seal it. Uh, but, you know, this kind of sealing uh, condition, this kind of sealing condition is very common. <clears throat> it's very, com very common for, for this type of uh, vegetable production because, you know, you've already got, uh, you know, you already gonna, it's, this is not for sealing. This is really for, you know, weed suppression. It's a physical barrier. It's a physical barrier for weed suppression. But then if you have uh, had experience with this and you'll probably have seen that, you know, even with this little thin barrier of weed suppression, there's still going to be weeds coming out uh, here and there and stuff. So, <clears throat> so uh, for that, we're like, uh, what if, you know, how do we make use of this, uh, this sealed condition in, uh, in vegetable production? So that comes, then we come up with the, uh, the next experiment. So again, we're still testing uh, crabgrass and uh, uh, amaranth. And then we look at different vegetables. Uh, we look at different types of vegetables, see, uh, whether, you know, they're going to affect these uh, seed germination of the vegetables. And, and in this the vegetables, we have uh, two, two types. And, you know, the, the, the bottom three, the bottom three, the bottom three types oh, are in the same family or actually in the same uh, genus as one of the uh, mustard seed, seed meal, you know, the, as one of the mustard, uh, you know, the, the brassica. Uh, Junsia, the Pacific Gold, and then these two are the non-brassicas. <clears throat> uh, so we, this is the, so in this, what we did is, okay, we applied, you know, this amount of, uh, <clears throat> we applied low, medium, high, three amounts of uh, mustard seed meal, in the uh, mustard seed meal in the uh, in the in the petri dish, and then we seal it. We you know we seal it for uh, either one day or three days or five days or seven days. So basically, uh, this group we seal it for one day and then we open it up. For this, we sealed it for three days. For this, we sealed it for five days, and for this, we sealed it for for seven days. Um, so you could see that uh, uh, you could see that uh, uh, this is, uh, and then again, you know, on, on this, uh, on one side is uh, amaranth, and on the other side is uh, crabgrass. <clears throat> so as you can see, that of course, uh, you know, the higher the amount of mustard seed meal is, the better uh, weed control, uh, and then also. Uh, 
uh, if you if you look at uh, uh, maybe just this one, uh, you know, the high the the longer we seal it, the longer we seal it, uh, the better uh, we control we have. And then uh, it's it's a similar a case in this one. Um, so for Pacific Gold, even at the low amount, you know, sealing it, you know, sealing the, uh, you know, sealing the, uh, the Petri dish had significant impact on the amount of uh, germination that we had. And again, Pacific Gold is the one with mainly um, volatile substance and Ida Gold is the one mainly with the soluble substance. So you could see the difference here. <coughs> And then we look at the uh, look at the vegetable. Uh, we look at the vegetable and you know see how long the um, the sealing would affect. How long the sealing would affect. Um, so what we have here is uh, um, I think this is onion. Uh, what this is onion, and this is this on this side is kale. On this side is uh, is uh, is lettuce. So uh, again, a similar story, um, but these uh, seeds are not as affected, you know, not as bad as, as the wheat seeds. Uh, if you think about, um, it, could be, it could be the size or something, but the, the vegetable seeds are not affected uh, as bad as the wheat seeds. And this is a, a black lettuce and the, the Mitsuna green. Also similar story. They are affected, uh, but not as bad as, uh, as the wheat seeds. Um, I just wanna say that my students actually take, uh, took, a lot, uh, took a lot of data. You know, uh, for, this is just an example of, of one of the data. So basically, uh, all those pictures that I show you, all those pictures that I show you, there is a graph like this. There is a graph like this, you know, showing that, you know, for how many days that, you know, the, the germination um, stopped or something. So, so uh, I want to go back here. So what, what can we, uh, what can we uh, learn from, you know, the difference? What can we learn from the difference uh, between, you know, the effect on the seeds and the effect on the, uh, on the, uh, on the, uh, the vegetables? Um, so there is definitely, a, First of all, there's definitely an uh, effect on the on the weeds. You know, the longer the longer that you seal it, the longer uh, I mean, the less germination we're gonna have. And then the second thing is, it seems like the uh, the vegetables that we tested were not as uh, badly affected like the seeds. So uh, if if so, in this case, if um, if uh, you know, under this plastic culture that you're going to, uh, you know, you're going to seed, uh, it's probably advice, it's probably wise to wait a couple of days if mustard seed meal, you know, if mustard seed meal is incorporated, uh, if mustard seed meal is incorporated inside before uh, this plastic mulch is applied. <clears throat> so that uh, you know, it would only affect the uh, it will only affect the uh, the wheat germination, and then you know, and then you open it up, it wouldn't affect your uh, vegetable seed germination that much. With that said, most of the time, most of the time when farmers do this kind of uh, production, they do not direct seed, and as you can see here, that they just directly you know they transplant. They transplant these vegetables, and at this stage, uh, they are really not uh, affected by the mustard seed meal uh, that much. If you can see that, you know. Um, um, so this this is uh, you know applied in the, in nursery uh, in 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 vegetable production. So in in landscapes in in landscapes um, in landscapes. Uh, we, you know, 
I think uh, it's probably not feasible to have this kind of coverage, uh, you know, to not feasible to have this kind of coverage. But um, there is a chance, let's say, when you first establish, when you first establish certain things, and we have seen uh, using, uh, what is the word for, uh, you know, fumigation, you know, and if you could incorporate biofumigation with, uh, with mustard seed meal, that will probably help to uh, increase your chance to kill more uh, wheat seeds, you know, just, uh, you know, using both the sun and the uh, mustard seed meal to uh, eliminate as much, uh, you know, um, seeds, uh, you know, from the seed bank as possible. So that would, uh, that would be one uh, application that I could think of. Um, I'm gonna go. Um, so uh, as we can see that, uh, you know, both, uh, so these, for these two mustard seed meals, one has uh, a better uh, herbicidal effects uh, on the uh, wheat emergence. One is better kind of incorporated in a little bit. The other one is more surface applied. So, uh, so uh, probably, you know, the combination. So the best herbicidal efficacy will probably be the best by by both, you know, by sealing, by sealing the mustard seed meal uh, treated soil and also apply on the uh, soil surface so that the effect is not so much diluted uh, to the, um, to the, uh, you know, to the, to the ground. And then uh, theoretically that they are, you know, effective, um, you know, to control uh, both broadleaf and the grassy weeds. Um, so what it does, uh, and as you can see that uh, um, on the experiments that we're doing, we're both looking at the germination level. So it's, so for one thing that it's more effective as, uh, as a pre-emergent, as pre-emergent herbicide. Uh, and this is kind of similar to the effect of, uh, of the weed, of the weed and feed, and don't uh, the weed and feed product in the store? I say similar, but not exactly the same, uh, because you know the rates and stuff. You know, in in applied in the landscape situations, we still uh, need to figure it out. So it's you know it also has fertilizer uh, very low in the single digit, but still there is a you know some fertilizer fertility in it. And and the second thing is it pretty much does nothing. It pretty much does nothing to a plant like this. Uh, Dr. Bolin, what is this plant again? It's purple nut sedge. Purple nut sedge. And you covered it uh, in, your, uh, in your talk last week, right? Um, I think we talked about it briefly because we were talking about perennials. Okay. So, so uh, mustard seed meal again, you know, it's more a pre-emergent, it has some a pre-emergent herbicidal effect. It doesn't do a whole lot for a, a perennial uh, weed like this purple nut sedge. And the reason I presented this here is this is a little gift for my daughter. This is her first uh, floral arrangement. So to Dr. Bolin, this is a weed, but to my daughter, this is just a beautiful flower. A weed is only a weed if it's somewhere you don't want it. And when it's on your mantle, you know, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, that's the end of my uh, presentation. And we're going to move on to uh, plan of the week. Okay. Well, thank you, Mung Mung. So our plant of the week today is Belinda's Dream Rose. Uh, this is one of the Texas superstars. Uh, there are only four roses in the Texas Superstars, and uh, plus we've, we've got the Earthkind roses, but I uh, really like Belinda's Dream. I had this in the landscape for quite a while. Uh, it is a very uh, stellar performer. Um, very nice habit with, with regard to the overall shape and the uh, flower production on it. Yeah, as you can see, these nice pink flowers, uh, it does give you that hybrid tea presentation, which is always nice. Uh, they do have a fragrance. Um, it, I would say the one negative on this plant is it's not a self-cleaner, meaning you are going to have to deadhead it. 
Um, these pink flowers will stay on for quite a while. They'll turn tan, brown, uh, and just like looks like wet tissues. Um, it, it, it looks, it, it doesn't have a very good look on that side of it. But when these are in production, you can see the, uh, uh, the flower production is quite quite strong. Um, it does get a little bit of a black spot. Down here in Houston, I would see it as we transitioned, um, you know, usually from summer into the cooler uh, temperatures, uh, when our night temperatures started getting cooler. Um, but it wasn't very heavy. Uh, it was predominantly on the older foliage, down in the plant, um, nothing major, not a lot of major defoliation. So uh, overall, uh, and I never sprayed anything on it, uh, never had any major problems. Uh, and in the landscape, it, it's going to top out at about five feet. Um, so it, it's, it's a, it behaves itself. It's not overly aggressive. Um, and it's just a really, you know, strong producer, strong performer uh, in the landscape. So uh, if you're considering, if you're looking for a pink rose uh, that's got that uh, uh, hybrid tea look and some fragrance, uh, Belinda's Dream might be uh, one that you want to consider. I was curious about the name and I just looked it up. Do you guys know the story? Go ahead. Yes, tell it. So, so it says, uh, I don't know how to say his last name, Dr. Robert Bays or Basie. Basie. The developer, Basie. the developer of Belinda's Dream, a retired mathematics professor, which I thought was cool, at a &M University has been breeding roses for most of his life. Uh, his goals were to develop thornless, hardy, drought tolerant, and disease resistant cultivars. Uh, Belinda's dream was the result of a cross between Tiffany and Jersey Beauty. However, he was hesitant of releasing this rose because it was not thornless. Uh, Dr. Basie finally agreed to release Belinda's dream in 1988, and he named the rose for the daughter of a friend in Caldwell, Texas. Hmm. Yep. That's and if it was only thornless, it probably would be perfect because it is, of all the kind of like shrub roses, it's the most... Um, attractive flower in a lot of ways. Yes. I mean, it's really nice. So yeah, quite beautiful. Although I'm also not sure how appealing the wet tissue look is, especially with flu season well, coming around. <laughs> that was a... You know, <laughs> you can cut these things and put them in a vase and then you won't have to oh, deal there you with go. wet tissue. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have them inside next to your tissue box. You know, we get yeah, to well, go. Well, the, the puddles will just, you know, fall off. <laughs> we'll have that. So. So do we want to talk about the, uh, the Wi-Fi issue? That's yeah, do you mind? Uh, yeah. Let me share my screen over on Yonder. Go ahead. Yeah, so there's been a lot of reports recently from uh, different people that there's been an abundance of white flies um, outside. And this is uh, mainly in Texas, I've seen from around Austin uh, and also in our area and the Dallas region. This is just an example right here. I just took this uh, just like about an hour ago, this video, and this is on my coleus. Uh, you can just see, does everyone see, y'all see those white flies moving around? Might be a little bit choppy. Uh, I'm not sure how good the stream works. It's, it's very good. They're like a white flaky uh, coconut flakes. <laughs> They're like coconut flakes. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I don't suggest sprinkling them on ice cream or anything like that. <laughs> Um, it wouldn't hurt you, but, <laughs> but yeah, so there's, there's a huge, uh, there's, there's a lot of them you can see here. Um, like I said, I've gotten a lot of personal, um, uh, correspondence, but even on Twitter, Alex Wild is based in Austin, uh, took a photo and, and posted it up here. Janet Hurley, our entomologist there said they're saying they're, they're seeing a large abundance in North Texas as well. Uh, Becky, you said that you've, you've seen some, some clouds of them. So they seem to be. Um, highly abundant starting about last week. I have not seen any eggs or any nymphs or pupae produced just yet. Now, mind you with white flies, uh, their whole life cycle can take about 16 days when it's really warm right now. It's cooling off might take a little bit longer, but still I'd expect to see some egg masses. So this is a little bit closer. Again, this is on my tomato plant in this case. So they do have a broad host range. I'm not certain now, I mean, Carlos, you, you might be able to chime in here. You know, some people will uh, say that you can differentiate between our common sweet potato white fly and the greenhouse white fly by how the wings are held. 
uh, with greenhouse white fly holding them kind of a little bit more flat. And so if you saw this photo uh, taken by Alex Wild, it looks like it's held kind of flat. So it suggests it might be the greenhouse white fly. Whereas in the photos I've taken, they seem to be a little bit more angled. I have seen some photos of greenhouse white fly where those wings are held at more of an angle. I don't think that's a distinguishing feature of this particular, uh, of those, or differentiating those particular species. So I, I'm, not ex I'm not certain whether it's greenhouse white fly, sweet potato white fly, or something else, but we are not seeing, like I said, I haven't seen any egg masses. Usually you'd see a little, you know, puffs of, of wax, uh, sometimes in little circles that would um, suggest that you have some uh, eggs on there. So I haven't seen too many eggs yet. So I, I don't know if it's something to be really concerned about. If you are producing poinsettias, I would be keeping a very close eye on how their populations are doing on your poinsettias. If you start getting eggs, you might consider some kind of preemptive action. Otherwise that population would build very quickly. Um, if, if they are actually starting to produce eggs. So I just wanted to bring that up. If you are seeing stuff like this, uh, if you're seeing a lot of these white flies, I think I saw uh, Brenda had made some uh, posts on, on Facebook about them as well. And you know, you're in Tyler. So I'm assuming that you're, you're seeing them as well. I had a few people in the Tyler area tell me that they've seen large abundances of, of these white flies. But if you're seeing them, let me know. I'd be interested. I uh, don't really know what the source is. Sometimes, um, you know, it's been suggested, I've heard a lot of anecdotes of when cotton is harvested and or defoliated, uh, there can be lots of white flies on them and they have no place to go. And so they will move in clouds uh, to, to new locations. So that's one possibility, but it could have been any other commodity as well. Yeah, it's, uh, it's tough to see from those pictures, but it, it did look to me uh, <clears throat> like a uh, Mimesia white flies. Yeah, okay. It, it takes them one, once they change hosts, for example, if they were coming from cotton, uh, uh, it takes them a little while to, to start laying eggs on a new, new host. It, it seems like they, they have to start feeding on the new host a little bit before they start laying eggs on, on that new host. So I'm not surprised that you haven't seen uh, egg masses yet, but, but uh, I assure you they, they will come. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, keep your eyes open. Yeah, yeah, we were talking about the uh, the cotton uh, and this two. Well, it's the 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 Saturday the Saturday before last. Uh, we just you know got a, a emergency email from one of our colleagues in horticulture department that uh, uh, his uh, you know the the surrounding all of our horticulture uh, field research field. Uh, our cottons, our agro agronomic crops, and uh, and during this time of the year, a lot of cotton were grown, and somebody did a uh, an aerial application of cotton defoliant uh, that uh, that obviously you know all the leaves on cotton are gone, and the you know the white flies, if they had some white flies, they may have to look for something fresh to eat. And then in our case, our horticulture crops will be wonderful, you know, for them, you know, just like in your case, tomatoes and stuff, horticulture, horticulture crops will be wonderful for them to, to, they may not prefer that much, but hey, it's, it's better than nothing. But then in our case, uh, the, the aerial, think about it, it's aerial application of cotton defoliant. So uh, it got on all of our uh, uh, trial plants. In my case, you know, my jujube plants, my uh, crape myrtles, my many other plants, figs. They just uh, they're not defoliated, not as bad. But uh, the one got defoliated the worst was uh, was the jujube plants. The crape myrtle plants are kind of holding up, um, you know, slightly better. But there are being you know just spots, leaf spots everywhere, leaf spots everywhere. So. Uh, so, so two points that I want to share with you. One is that jujube plants, I'm going to mention that again, Dr. Volin is laughing, the jujube plants does not like cotton defoliant. They, uh, they get defoliated uh, as bad as cotton. Uh, I've seen, you know, 50 to 100% defoliation. And then number two is that uh, crepe myrtles are really, really tough. Crepe myrtles are yeah. really, really tough that, uh, oh, yeah. Despite, despite all the uh, the, despite all the, the the spray on them, the uh, 
the um, you know the the leaf spots on them that they're kind of still uh, holding on. <laughs> Even I've seen some some you know the tip die back and stuff. They're kind of holding on, and just uh, mine was not damaged that bad. But uh, a, a colleague of mine, you know, a lot of the annuals uh, research that that he was doing that just got hammered by the cotton defoliant. <laughs> Hey, Mung Mung, have y'all been able to take some good pictures of everything? I have lots of great pictures. <laughs> I'll be share, I'll be willing to share with you. I'm uh, pretty excited that I can now answer the question, will, will defoliating my cotton hurt my crepe myrtle? <laughs> be like, no. No, but your juju bees. <laughs> <laughs> Poor juju bees. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> Well, one of the things that uh, that that I worried in my case is that we have a lot of not so hardy hybrids in our trial, you know, in our trial side, and and this is a critical. This is really a critical time of the year where we have a lot of rain. The the temperature is about right, so this is when they just you know they. Uh, they, they, they get all happy and, and try to do as much as they can prepare for the winter and then boom, you know, the, 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 the leaf spots definitely going to affect them. But I'm glad that I uh, was able to contribute to your knowledge pool that, you know, the, to answer that specific question, you know, whether, um, whether that would defoliate. Um, yes. Yeah. What, what do they typically, do they use a synthetic oxen for cotton defoliation typically? Uh, this matter is still under investigation. I may not be able to provide further information. <laughs> I need to speak to your lawyer. <laughs> Thank you, Bowling. Yes. 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 I think that was the answer, yeah. That, that was okay. the answer, yes. So it's a synthetic oxen. Is it? Okay, 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 okay. Sounded like Dr. Kevin Ong. He, he knows oh, everything. Know. A yeah. voice from the heavens. <laughs> <Yeah>. Becky, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Whenever you had a fork in your life, you just hear Kevin Ong yell yes or no yes. in the background. I feel like I should know what they used to defoliate cotton because I lived in Lubbock for so long, but it's just been a really long time since I have been around that world. So, um, Well, before anything else, I want to uh, let you know that uh, uh, the link of that, you know, of the of all the recordings of the uh, chat with the Green Aggies, 22 videos now, and then after today there will be 23. They're all going to be in that link. You click on that one link, all 22, and then 23 videos is going to show up. So uh, I hope you will, you know, go back and catch on what you have missed. And Dr. Baldwin, do you have something to share? I do. You do? I sure do. You're gonna share it in the uh, in the chat, right? I'm gonna share it in the chat. So here's the link to the survey. And um, we had several responses last week, so we're really, really appreciative of that. And if you will do the same again this week, again, it only takes about, I really think it only takes about two to three minutes to complete, if that. So it's a very, very short survey and it really helps us out. If you guys don't mind clicking on this link that I just shared in the chat, it'll take you to Qualtrics um, within our AgriLife uh, server where you can just complete the survey really quickly and then you're done. Okay. All right. All right. That's it for our uh, chat with Green Aggies this week. And we really appreciate your attention. And if anything, uh, any questions, any concerns and stuff like that, shoot it our way uh, to myself or any of us on the panel. Uh, we appreciate your attention and have a, a great the rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.